Well, what's in the news this week? Oh, the big news was Saddam Hussein's capture. It is just amazing how journalists, reporters, politicians, all these people can talk as though they're in a world somewhere else from the world that I live in. Because the world I live in, the fact that Saddam Hussein was captured, has nothing to do with the justification for the war. But yet everything that I saw last Sunday and for a day or two afterward seemed to indicate that this was a great triumph for George Bush, that having captured Saddam Hussein, that made the whole war all right. The fact that he had misled us about weapons of mass destruction, misled the American people about the Al-Qaeda training camps, about the mobile laboratories, about the uh, enriched uranium from Niger, about the aluminum tubes, about the unmanned vehicles, all of these different things, that didn't matter at all now because they had captured Saddam Hussein. And Wolf Blitzer even made the astounding statement, Wolf Blitzer of CNN, that this will show the Iraqi people that George Bush means business. And if you understand what he meant by that, I hope you'll call up and explain it to me because I didn't get it at all. Obviously, George Bush means business, but the only business he's concerned with is getting reelected. The point is that I don't see what all the hoopla was about. I, I understand that they are glad to have captured him, but it does not provide a vindication for anything that George Bush has done up to this point because he didn't go take us into war saying the whole purpose of this war is to capture Saddam Hussein, and when we capture him, that will prove that I was right. No, he made all sorts of statements, and he made all sorts of promises about how the Iraqi people were going to be free. Well, of course, they're not free. They're living in a, a state where they're occupied by foreign power. They have to carry ID cards. They have to go through checkpoints and roadblocks, and some of the towns are ringed with barbed wire. Uh, the occupying force is destroying houses without warning and without due process of law, and this, this they call liberation. Well, it's really something. Before we go to the phones, let me return to the question of the Hussein capture. I do have one idea as to why such a big thing is being made out of this Hussein capture as though it were somehow a vindication for everything our government has done, invading Iraq, killing a lot of Iraqis, and letting a lot of Americans be killed, and, of course, costing us enormous sums of money that you and I are going to have to pay for. We were told, of course, before the war, and just one more falsehood, that the Iraqi oil would pay for the reconstruction of Iraq, and for some reason that isn't happening. It's coming out of the federal budget. But I believe that the capture of Hussein allows our government to focus once again on Hussein, to make him the subject of everything, and by constantly reminding us of what a butcher, what an ogre, what a sadist, what a mad dictator he was, it allows our country to be united on something, to be able to all agree on something. And it so much reminds me of George Orwell's novel, 1984. For example, George Bush cannot mention Hussein without referring to the rape rooms and the mass graves and the torture of children in front of their parents and all of these things constantly reminding us of what a terrible person he was. And in the novel, 1984, every morning, Everybody had to get together in every office in the land and engage in five minutes of hate. And the hate was all directed at Goldstein. Every office and every home, every place had a television screen. And that television screen would broadcast messages from Big Brother, speeches by Big Brother, and other news and so forth. And for five minutes, they would show this Goldstein's picture. He's supposedly the head of the resistance and the underground that's seeking to undermine the country, and nobody had ever seen him, nobody even really knew for sure that he existed, but he was the focus of hate. And for five minutes, everybody in an office or anyplace else, in a public square, wherever, was expected to shout obscenities at Goldstein, this terrible man, oh, oh, and we all got worked up in our mutual hatred for this person, and it allowed us to bond, as they say. And I think that's what's going on here. We keep being reminded of what a horrible person Hussein was, and isn't it wonderful what we have done? We, the American people, have rid the world of this terrible person. And let's not forget just how terrible he was. And on that subject, you know, one of the problems has been that nobody in the press is really, really being very, very skeptical about the administration's claims. But... Immediately after the capture of Hussein, Diane Sawyer interviewed President Bush, and it really is amazing how she held his feet to the fire. She said, 50% of the American people have said that they think the administration exaggerated the evidence going into the war with Iraq. Weapons of mass destruction, connection to terrorism. Are the American people wrong, misguided? And Bush responds by saying, well, the intelligence I operate on was good intelligence and so forth, and my predecessor also operated on it, and I went to the United Nations, and I did this, and, I, and it just goes all over the map. So she comes back and says, but let me try to ask. This could be a long question. When you take a look back, all these people said all these things, the yellow cake and Niger, and so on, and so on, and so on, and now the inspectors have said they can't confirm any of this. They can't corroborate. And Bush says, yet. And Sawyer starts to say something else, and Bush again says, yet. And then Diane Sawyer says, is it yet? 
And Bush answers by saying, well, David Kay did discover that they had a weapons program. And I'll, I'll continue with this for a minute when we come back from the break, because I think it's very, very important. And when Bush was going all around the place, all around the barn, trying to keep the subject off of, did you guys lie about all this? He finally comes back to, and look, there is no doubt that Saddam Hussein was a dangerous person. And there's no doubt that we had a body of evidence proving that. And there is no doubt that the president must act after 9-11 to make America a more secure country. Now listen to that. A month or two ago, he said, hey, I never told anybody that Saddam Hussein was behind the 9-11 attack. And he can point to this and say, he didn't say that Saddam Hussein was behind it. He said that there is no doubt that Saddam Hussein was a dangerous person. And there's no doubt we had a body of evidence proving that. And there's no doubt that the president must act after 9-11 to make America a more secure country. It's just amazing how many times he has uttered a sentence that had the words Hussein and 9-11 both in the same sentence. But Sawyer won't be denied. She says, again, I'm just trying to ask. These are supporters, people who believed the war, who have asked this question. And Bush says, well, you can keep asking the question, and my answer is going to be the same. Saddam was, a, Saddam was a danger, and the world is better off because we got rid of him. And Sawyer says, but stated as a hard fact that there were weapons of mass destruction as opposed to the possibility that he could have moved to acquire those weapons still. Bush interrupts and says, so what's the difference? The possibility that he could acquire weapons. If he were to acquire weapons, he would be the danger. That's, that's, that's what I'm trying to explain to you. A gathering threat after 9-11 is a threat that needed to be dealt with. And it was done after 12 long years of the world saying the man's a danger. And so we got rid of him. And there's no doubt the world is a safer, freer place as a result of Saddam being gone. And Sawyer says, but, but again, some, some of the critics have said this combined with the failure to establish proof of, of elaborate terrorist contacts has indicated that there's just not precision at best and misleading at worst. And Bush says, yeah, look, what, what we based our evidence on was a very sound national intelligence estimate. And Sawyer says, nothing should have been more precise. Bush says, what I, I, I made my decision based upon enough intelligence to tell me that this country was threatened with Saddam Hussein in power. And Sawyer says, what would it take to convince you he didn't have weapons of mass destruction? <laughs> Bush says, Saddam Hussein was a threat, and the fact that he is gone means America is a safer country. Sawyer says, and if he doesn't have weapons of mass destruction? Bush says, Diane, you can keep asking the question. I'm telling you. I made the right decision for America. Sawyer says, but, and Bush says, because Saddam Hussein used weapons of mass destruction, invaded Kuwait, but the fact that he is not there is means America is a more secure country. Amen, brother. And we will all now have our five minutes of hate against Saddam Hussein. And, of course, this, today the news was that Gaddafi has agreed to get rid of his weapons of mass destruction, and it is amazing how Blair and Bush are treating Gaddafi with great respect. Hussein said he got rid of his weapons of mass destruction and nobody would believe him. But Blair even said that uh, Gaddafi's decision was a courageous one. Boy, it all depends on which thing you're going to be indignant about, which uh, is the enemy of the hour. And three months from now or six months from now, it could be Gaddafi who's the enemy of the hour. And Bush saying that he promised to get rid of his weapons of mass destruction, but he's misleading the U.N. inspectors and this, that, and the other thing. And guess what, folks? we got to go in there and clean house. Well, let's clean our own house here, and let's start by getting Roger in here with a broom. Roger from Clymer, New York. Good evening. Harry, can you hear me? I can hear you just fine, Roger. Okay. Uh, thanks for taking my call. I wanted to um, I wanted to apologize my, my feelings to Saddam Hussein. I just figured that the government would never capture him like Osama bin Laden because now once you've captured him, now you've, quote, taken out an enemy. You always want an enemy. Mm -hmm. But now you've captured him. Well, he's no longer an enemy. Uh, you know, so now you have to come up with another enemy. Well, maybe we started today with Gaddafi. Yep. Anyway, uh, the other thing, well, two other things were, I want to congratulate the federal government. Um, Bush signed a bill, you know, saying that you know they're going to not try to control spam on the internet. They are, or they're not. They are. Okay. Uh, yeah, the federal government is now going to control spam on the internet. Now, I guess they want you to give them your email address, and then it'll be just like that do not call routine. Right. But isn't this just the first step of the government meddling in the internet? Well, it certainly looks like it. I mean. I there are all we've we've discussed this before on the show that there are all kinds of programs out there that will filter out spam for you. Some of them do better jobs than others. Some of them will be more exacting than others. But the fact of the matter is that there's no reason to believe that whatever the federal government is going to do is going to be any better than what you could do for yourself. And if you do it for yourself, then you can choose which level of security you want, which level of privacy you want. But when the federal government does it, it's one size fits all, and it never seems to produce the result that was promised for it. Yes, and the third thing is I got a email from some source, you know, that, that I have subscribed to, and they were complaining, um, how shall I say it, Boston and New Hampshire are, are going to buy drugs now from Canada, you know, the, those state governments for federal government mandates, you know, to save money. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the federal government is saying, no, 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 you have to buy it here. 
But the beauty of it is, is that, and I have no way of confirming it, that source said the biggest purchaser of Canadian drugs is the federal government because the Department of Defense got a waiver to buy drugs from Canada to save money. Oh, I didn't know that. So I, well, I don't know if it's true or not. You know, it was sent to me in an email. And oh, I see. Yeah, but it, but it certainly would not surprise me in any way, shape, or form. No, what's good for the goose is never good enough for the gander. Meaning, we're the ganders. <laughs> we don't get the same privileges that anybody else does. If you want, I could forward that email to you. But, sure, go ahead. And uh, maybe there's a some kind of a lead in there as to where this could be tracked down. But, but you know, it, it's just something that uh, this government is known to do. Uh, every yeah, you know, everything comes down to the the little person getting stuck paying for all this, whether paying for it in taxes, indirect taxes, or paying for it on interest on the debt. Sure. Um, no question about it. Uh, it's a $2 trillion budget, and no matter how they rearrange the tax code, the fact is that the only people around to pay that $2 trillion are people like you and me. And the Russians aren't going to pay it. The Martians aren't going to pay it. Slavon Don Milosevic isn't going to pay it. Saddam Hussein isn't going to pay it. It's going to be us that has to pay that $2 trillion a year one way or another. Anyway, those were the three comments for tonight. And, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, and... Uh, uh, Happy holidays. Well, same to you, Roger. Thanks for sharing your thoughts with us during the past year. Let's go now to Pittsburgh and talk with Rob. Good evening, Rob. Hi, Harry Brown. Nice to talk to you again. Thank you. You too. Um, you know, I really uh, appreciate that article that you wrote to your daughter. And I uh, I had already read it in the past on your website, but it was really nice to hear you reading it. And um, I really, that's a lesson that I wish I had learned at a much, 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 much earlier age. And uh, I think I'm starting to learn that lesson, but I, I'm not even convinced I've fully learned it myself, but it's very valuable. You know. Well, there's a difference between understanding something intellectually and being able to feel it emotional. You can understand, for instance, that you shouldn't be jealous or you shouldn't be afraid or whatever it is, but that doesn't mean your emotions are going to fall in line automatically. And one of the big problems that people have sometimes is in thinking that they can dictate to their emotions and you have to recognize your emotions and you have to recognize that sometimes they haven't caught up with your intellect yet and you've got to be very careful not to walk into trouble thinking that just because you know something is right it will be handled correctly it's, yeah. it's good that uh, you look at yourself and can recognize where you are at any given time well it's just uh it's sort of like when you told her that she might want to read it every year to learn it more deeply you know i think uh like i say i wish i had learned a lot of these things when i was much younger but um you know, I just keep trying to remind myself of these things. Every time I feel resentment because I feel I didn't get my, I don't know, what, what I think people Fair share. Me. What? Yes. Fair share. You know, if I feel like I didn't even just get the respect, I, I think, you know, or whatever. And, you know, I, I remind myself. I mean, I think I, this is something I tried to figure out. I tried to learn even before I read your article, but you're, you know, that nobody owes you anything. But when I read your article, I thought, wow, this is a really good article on this subject, you know. And the, I haven't read uh, How You Found Freedom in an Unfree World yet, but I listened to your talk about it on your audio archives. And... It, it was very brilliant, and very humorous, actually. And the, I think you talked about traps and the, the feeling that people owe you something is, is one. I think is one of those traps, you know. But um, very definitely. And you mentioned respect, and that's a good good example because a lot of people will say, "Well, I understand that he may not agree with me, but he at least should respect my position, or he at least should respect me for this or that or that." No, he doesn't have to do anything. He'll do what he wants to do. He'll do what his knowledge, what his understanding, what his motives, what his desires dictate for him. He is not there living for you. He is not there. He's not on this earth to respect you, to love you, to like you, or anything else. He's there to pursue his own interests. And if they happen to coincide with yours, so much the better. Oh, yeah. But if they don't, that's his business. Don't make his problem your problem. Yeah, well, here's the thing. Um, I'm thinking that Saddam's arrest might help Bush win Bush's re-election despite uh, everything that you just pointed out, like from the way he responded to Diane Sawyer, for example. And the thing is that I do not want to see Bush get re-elected, but, you know, I am... Um, I think if Bush doesn't get re I mean, we can, we, if, you, if you don't want to see Bush get reelected, you can take heart because uh, his father beat Saddam in a war. His father had Manuel Noriega arrested. His father claimed that Panama was a free country as a result of that, just as his son is claiming that Iraq is now a free country despite what's actually going on over there, just because the former dictator got arrested. And um, so, you know, and, and the Bush's father lost his uh, bid for re-election anyway. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing is, though, is that I read about the Howard Deans and the John Kerry's and the Kucinich and people like this. I don't want to see these guys either. A friend of mine, a friend of mine, said to me like, "Hey, uh, what do you think of Kucinich?" And he handed me a little flyer, about, a little brochure about him. And I said, "Well, he wants to get the troops out of Iraq. That's great." But then it said, "Universal health care and end all medicine for profit." And I was like, "Oh yeah. yeah, I know it's." Uh, there, there's no, there's nobody you can turn to. As I've said so often, you either vote libertarian or you don't vote at all, and you're not going to uh, vote for the winner when you vote libertarian, but at least you have not given an endorsement to people who are going to try to turn your life further upside down. Well, yeah, I mean, get this. It, it, this is a classic example of people thinking that somebody owes them something, is that, well, the government should provide health care for everybody. And I try to explain to people, I'm not against health care, but it's going to be crappy health care for everybody. Of course it is. And, Rob, thanks so much. Always glad to hear from you. Thank you. 
So let's talk to Glenn in Tampa, Florida. Good evening, Glenn. Greetings, you beautiful human. Oh, my goodness, it's that Glenn. Glenn, that Klein, Glenn. Glenn Klein in Tampa, Florida, who used to be on this show with me every single week, but got such to be such a successful businessman, he just no longer could do it. How are you doing, Glenn? I'm doing wonderfully. Uh, I'm not 29 years old, uh, <laughs> but I do play one on TV. Oh, good for you. You know what your problem is, Harry? What's that? You like to tell the truth. <laughs> and it's like a Jack Nicholson and a few good men. They can't handle the truth. What, 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 what is it, Harry? That, what, somebody like yourself, just the, you know, your average American, everyday presidential candidate, tells the truth, and people freak out. I mean, your, your argument is so logical, so concise, so to the point, so accurate, and yet everybody, I mean, this last gentleman that just called from Pittsburgh, to get on the Dennis Kucinich bandwagon, you might as well be on the George W. Bush bandwagon. Yes, but it's understand, exactly understand right. that he said he was. He thought, well, there's somebody that's against the war until he saw one of his flyers and saw what this guy was standing for. Right, right. He's, he's against the war, but he's for socialism. That's beautiful. Sure, but and, and I, it's I, the I, same with Howard Dean and John Kerry and all these other people. It's the same thing, except the only thing about the difference between Kucinich and George W. Bush is that Kucinich could only dream of growing the federal government the way that W. has. You know, this really brings up a very important point, and that is in the year 2000, so many people voted for George Bush because he wasn't Al Gore. And a lot of people are going to vote for Howard Dean or whoever the Democratic candidate is simply because he's not George Bush. And then they're going to have to deal with a whole new set of problems that will be presented by Howard Dean. I doubt that Howard Dean could spend money any faster than George Bush can, as you alluded to there. No, it's not possible. It's, it's not, <laughs> the Republicans never would have let, let Al Gore get away with what they let W get away with. Oh, that's and very truth, true. And, and really, what, what, what the second uh, Tuesday, or excuse me, the first Tuesday in November is all about, it's really just an extension of the, of the primary season. See, the primaries get broken down into the Democrats and Republicans, but then we have one final primary. I mean, we just have one big Republican party. And what you say is if you don't vote Libertarian, you're not voting. That is 100% accurate, ladies and gentlemen, because all we've got is one big freaking party. Some call it Republicans, some call it Democrats, some call it liberals, some call it conservatives, but they all do one thing at the end of the day. They grow the federal government. This is not a healthy thing, Harry. Of course not. Very well put, Glenn. I think you ought to be on the radio. <laughs> well, actually, I, actually, I, I Let's talk with Larry in Sunnyvale, California. Good evening, Larry. Good evening, Harry. I finally heard a theory that makes sense to me about why Bush wanted this war with Saddam Hussein and has wanted it since he started his administration. Um, in order for this to make sense, first you, you have to assume that stability in the Middle East is an important goal and one that has to be done by America. This is something that I think it's clear the administration thinks is correct. Whether or not it's actually correct is another matter of debate. But from the perspective of the American government, it's important to have stability in the Middle East. So if you assume that, then the next thing you do is you notice that um, uh, while we're containing Saddam Hussein by having troops uh, in Saudi Arabia, this is making us unpopular in the Middle East. It would be nice to remove those troops, but if we simply remove them without doing anything about Saddam first, then Saddam is going to go right back to his old hijinks and invading people, and since we can't have that, destabilizing the Middle East. So uh, the choice presented, from their perspective anyway, the, uh, the American government is either to uh, keep the troops there forever and be unpopular, or to take out Saddam, which would then free us from having to watchdog him, and which would allow us to remove the troops from Saudi Arabia. The person who told me this said that uh, as the first bombs fell on Iraq, uh, Bush also announced that um, he would be pulling troops out of Saudi Arabia after the occupation of Iraq was over. And I don't remember saying that, but if that's true, that's at least some minor good news to come out of all this. Well, yes, the good news being that uh, American troops are going to be in one less country around the world, which would bring it down to 127 instead of 128, or whatever the current number is. The uh, theory rests on the assumption that the Bush administration people really believe that Hussein would have designs on Saudi Arabia and would invade it. And, of course, in the first Gulf War, that story made the rounds, and they showed uh, or they claimed they had satellite photos showing Hussein's troops massed on the Saudi border uh, after having invaded Kuwait and so forth. But that all turned out to be one more lie. But it was one of the lies that helped sell Congress on giving George Bush Sr. the resolution to go to war against Iraq. And I don't see why Hussein would have designs on Saudi Arabia. He had enough trouble with the sanctions and everything else that were going on. And, of course, very, very few people even have the faintest idea why uh, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in 1990. They just assumed that, well, he wanted to take over the whole Middle East and have all that oil to himself and so on. But there were very real problems that were going on between Iraq and Kuwait. And maybe Hussein picked the wrong way to settle the problems. But the fact is that there were real problems that had to do with Kuwaiti slant drilling into Iraqi property, uh, Kuwait uh, overstepping the quotas that had been given to it by OPEC and producing more oil than it was allotted, and also the fact that the two countries had almost come to an agreement for Kuwait to be merged into Iraq just a year before the whole invasion started. So it really is 
you know, it's kind of what you've offered from your friend is kind of a, a based on the simplified view that Hussein is this world dominating Hitler who's going to take over the whole Middle East if he isn't contained. And now that he's contained, America could pull troops out of Saudi Arabia and then maybe pull them out of Kuwait and Qatar and these other places where it has troops in the Middle East. Who knows? All we know is that the reasons that they gave didn't make any sense whatsoever. Yeah, I know. If this, if this theory, which, again, is the closest I've heard to making sense, if this theory is actually what went on, then why we had all this other hoo-ha about weapons of mass destruction, which never materialized, and uh, Hussein being uh, you know, a horrible person having the rape rooms and the torture and all that sort of thing, why we have all this other chaff in the way, occluding us from the actual reason, I'll never understand. Yes, well, I think that if uh, the theory is correct, then the, probably the politicians assumed that it was too intellectual an argument that people would not get all fired up. But if they thought that Hussein was in some mysterious way behind 9-11 and that he was prepared to attack the United States and he was acquiring the means to do so if he didn't have it already, then this could get people stirred up. And uh, obviously it did. I but, think so. Oh, the, the administration felt they had to trick the American populace into supporting the war. Yeah, isn't that unusual? <laughs> Never ever happened before in the history of the United States of America or any other country that politicians tricked the populace into going to war. Ah, well. Thanks so much, Larry. Glad to hear from you. Let's go to Minnesota now and talk with Armin. Good evening, Armin. Uh, actually, I'm in uh, Braden, Sarasota, but that's close enough. Sarasota, Florida? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Is it cold there this time of the year in Minnesota there, Armin? In Sarasota? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's pretty cool, actually. It's going to get in the very low 30s. Oh, really? I'll, I'll be darned. Where are you at? I'm in uh, Tennessee, and it was uh, last night, I guess it was, it was down to 25, something like that. So, okay. anyway, I, I'll be, I, I, isn't this winter just about ready to be over now? I've had all I want of the cold weather. I don't know. It's kind of a break for me. Uh, yeah, I guess it would be living in Sarasota. I don't know how we figured you lived in Minnesota, but oh, well. yeah, close enough uh, for government work. What's really? on your mind tonight? So, uh, a couple points, if I may, for some people that want to know some of the current motives of the Bush administration, uh, they can go out on the Internet and look up the PNAC, PNAC plan, and it gives a very detailed report of what their ideology is for positioning themselves in the Mideast to try to control the oil and use it as leverage over the emerging China and some other issues if they're interested. But Yeah, look, before we go on to anybody that's not familiar with that, PNAC, I believe, stands for People for the New American Century. And project. It is, oh, a new American oh, project. project for a new American century. Right. Oh, PNAC. Yeah, right. I'm thinking of people of the, for the American way. Wow. Yeah, project for a new American century, and it is uh, Richard Pearl, uh, Bill Crystal, all the neoconservatives, some Murdoch's of Murdoch's people. Yeah, some of whom are in the administration and some who aren't, but all who think that America should use its muscles to rule the world and make everything all right. And as long uh, as it's quote it correctly, as long as it's other people's muscles and other people's money and blood, and of course the insiders, including the PNAC members, profits. Yes, they, and, and they are, are doing very well. There's been a, a number of things that have come out about Richard Pearl, who was the chairman of the Defense Policy Board, which is an advisory agency that advises the administration on defense issues. Uh, Pearl was the chairman, and he stepped down, but he's still on the board, and he stepped down because of the conflicts of interest that were coming to light. He also is involved with investment companies. Uh, he has an investment advisory uh, company where they do money management. They put together investment deals, and all these deals are related to defense contracts. So what he does is he advises the government on what it should be doing, and then he turns around knowing what the government's going to do or what he's pressuring the government to do, and advises his clients then to invest in the right kind of uh, companies that will profit from the very policy that he's helping to make at the governmental level. But we don't call that a conflict of interest, of course, because he never, ever lets one thing cross over to the other side of his mind. But it has been, as you point out, it's a way for them, them to make a good deal of money for themselves. Exactly. And I'd like to talk about some other things, too. I'm, I want to throw this in, too, about Mr. Pearl, for all those people that want to rename French fries American fries. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mr. Pearl, that has a lot of influence with uh, the agenda of this administration, it's my understanding he has a real nice condo in uh, France. Oh, is that right? <laughs> so all those, you know, loyalists, you, if you get me. Sure. Uh, we're going to have to take we're going to have to take a break, Armin. Okay. So I want you to wait and then get started from uh, scratch with your second uh, item. Okay. And with these last few seconds, I'll just throw in the point that during the First World War, they renamed sauerkraut to freedom cabbage. Uh, just like they renamed French fries to Freedom Fries. This is Harry Brown. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. We're talking with Armin in Sarasota, Florida. And, Armin, what was the second point you wanted to make? Well, quickly, before I make that point, the gentleman that called about the drug waiver for Canadian drugs mm -hmm. and said it was the Department of Defense. The other one, too, is the Veterans Administration. And the Veterans Administration has a waiver to enable them to buy uh, prescription drugs not, from Canada? Yeah, the stuff that's not supposed to be okay for us, but we can pay for them to buy it for them, right. the veterans. But anyway... 
back to what we're talking about. Uh, I'd like to first say something. I, you may not want me to jump around, but I am a little bit here. In all fairness, it's my understanding also that a lot of people may not realize this. Excuse me, but in the early 70s, it was uh, Saddam Hussein's Iraq that broke the embargo in '73 before we totally tanked our economy and, and sold out of the OPEC embargo to us and got the oil flowing back at that point in time. And uh, that's not mentioned, but I remember reading that too. Well, it is interesting that you mentioned that. I had never heard that before. Another interesting uh, facet of this whole capture of Hussein business is how many people have suddenly this past week, various news outlets like Time Magazine and CNN, have suddenly started resurrecting all the the coverage of Rumsfeld going to Iraq in the 1980s as Ronald right. Reagan's envoy and, and uh, uh, giving Hussein support in his war against Iran. And I don't know why suddenly now they are bringing this out when they didn't do it before when all the talk was about how we had to go to war against Hussein. But it is an interesting thing that uh, I've, I've said for years and years and years that no one is ever as bad as the press makes him out to be, and of course no one is ever as good as the press makes him out to be, and I've always said that with regard to the press, but it applies to what politicians say and what the, the ogre of the month is or the hero of the month. Right, uh, right. It's, it's always carried to just absolutely absurd extremes. Harry, for, for you and your uh, listeners out there, too, that would w like to go to a website quickly on this issue, and then I have another point I'd like to bring up, it's on rents, R -E -N -S -E com. There's a very detailed story about April Gillespie's visit with Saddam, and it's the whole thing converted from Arabic to English, and you can read the context of the discussion and try to understand the mindset of Saddam at that point in time after what he did for us previous to that uh, meeting of, with April Gillespie, and then see how, like you were kind of dancing around, I thought, for a better word, talking to that guy about some of the stuff that's been going on that a lot of people aren't aware of over in the Mideast, political play in one side off of the other, and you'll see the point there that... Uh, he felt betrayed by uh, Kuwait and the United Arab immigrants for, uh, because uh, they were, he felt, going behind his back and doing things to him very negative after they fought that long and hard war, war with Iran that, of course, the U.S. and Israel played both sides against each other so they could obviously go in and go for one. That's my opinion. This is all planned way back in the Nixon days. And, uh, and for people anyway, who don't, don't know what you're talking about, April Gillespie was the American ambassador to Iraq at the time of the first Gulf War. Correct. And after, uh, uh, pardon me, a month before Hussein's troops invaded Kuwait in the summer of 1990, mm -hmm. Gillespie had a meeting with Hussein, and there was a lot of talk about the disputes with Kuwait, and Gillespie made it very clear that the United States took no position on this and was not going to interfere in any way. And so Hussein felt free to go ahead and invade Kuwait, and next thing you know, he'd been sandbagged. Right, and if you go read that on rense.com, it's very detailed, and you can, you can get a better perspective of the complexities of it and the point in time of it and the politics of it. I mean, it's, it's a snapshot, even though it's very detailed, but if you study up on, you know, a lot of the, you know, shadowy things going on with our government, you know, they say it's for our good, but yeah, right. Uh, anyway, that's a matter of opinion, right? And where you, and what line you're on the side of, you know? Sure. If it's, if it's a Republican president doing it and you're a Republican, then it's all for the best. And if it's a Democratic okay. president doing it and you're a Republican, well, then this is just perfidy. This is treason. Right. This is. Uh, Here's where I want to make my point and then I'll let you go on. I'd really love to. You know, philosophically, I agree with you on some things. I'd really love to spend a couple hours with you, and, and I think... Well, right now, we don't even have a couple of minutes. Make... Meanwhile, Armin, we are finally now going to find out what your second point was. Yeah, took a while to get here, huh? Sure. But I really appreciate your patience, and I have to agree with you. Your uh, music choice is superb. Well, thank you. I'm glad you like it. It's very refreshing. Okay, my next point would be, I didn't know it until recently, and maybe you'll know it now, that uh, we have a famous tag team in the White House. One part of the tag team is uh, Vice President Cheney, and in the Houston Chronicle, if I'm correct, it was this past week, there was an article about one of their offshore subsidiaries that uh, was dealing with uh, building up, trading with uh, one of the Axis members, uh, Iran. And for those that say, well, you know, Cheney's not tied with Halliburton now, you know, trying to you know, break the linkage, even though I'm not buying it at all. It's deferred payments about right, in my opinion. He's getting but, very, very large deferred payments every year. And, of course, when he leaves leaves government, uh, where is he going to go? Probably back to Halliburton again. Well, they tell me he's he's got one foot in each place right now. But, you know, that's the joke going around. But I don't think it's too funny considering, you know, our, our pocketbooks are getting thinner by the minute. But anyway, uh, here you have the tag team. Oh, I wanted to make this point. I also under, I'm under the understanding that while he is tenure at Halliburton, while he was there, he moved up the number of offshore uh, subsidiaries of Halliburton from 25 to 30 to 70 now. So, you know, it's not like he's, he's out of the, uh, you know, the loop. And anyway, the other side of the tag team, you have uh, W there, and his daddy's been for a long time associated with Carlisle. So the way it works is one side of the tag team goes into these other countries. Uh, they benefit from the taxpayers without our will or knowledge. Well, we lost the connection with Armin. I thought for a minute maybe we'd lost the connection with me. 
uh, that's unfortunate that Armin didn't get a chance to finish his point, but I think we all know that there are plenty of business connections there between the Bush White House and corporations around the country, and I don't mean to say that the Republicans are the party of big business. They're not really. They're just the party of big government, and they profit from big government just like the Democrats do. The Democrats also are all for corporate welfare, and it's just that when you have that kind of power, you're going to use it. And it's foolish to think that so, to say that somebody has misused the power because they should never have had the power in the first place. And when that power is so big and so vast and the opportunity is there to reward your friends and colleagues and business associates, then you are going to attract to government the worst possible elements of society because they will see it as a way not to be able to hold up people for pocket change but to hold up people through the government for millions and maybe even billions of dollars. Armin, I guess we lost you and now we have you back again. As the church lady used to say on Saturday Night Live, how convenient. But anyway. Yeah, now, some kind of a conspiracy to silence you. Well, hey, what the heck, brother, we're together again. But anyway, the other side of the tag team, and for people that didn't catch the break, you have uh, Dick Cheney and Halliburton and their subsidiaries on one side that goes into these countries, builds them up economically so they're strong, and then mysteriously or conveniently they politically become our enemy like the axis of evil of Iran supposedly is now. And then the Bush Carlisle Group, which is a bunch of defense insiders, and holding companies that have privileged information that know way ahead of time what's going to happen politically, they go in and clean house, and it's a seesaw of vast amounts of wealth accumulation. Sure. And Roosevelt called it uh, war profiteering, and I think he went after their grandfather in World War II for doing that. Even after Pearl Harbor started, they uh, went after their grandfather, Bush Prescott, for still trading with uh, Hitler. Mm -hmm. So well. the point being, you know, how much is enough? Maybe Time Magazine, you know, they're they're... Very powerful. Maybe maybe some of the elite are out there finally thinking this is just getting out of hand. These people are rolling so fast, too far, so quick, and they're becoming so intoxicated with power that maybe there's, I think there's a divide in the powers that be out there that they don't feel comfortable with the level of power that these people have possessed and taken so rapidly and what they're doing with it, that they don't feel secure even with these people. Well, as I said think? while you were off the, off the line, that the problem is the power exists there in Washington for people to profit in this way, and it is the power that must be taken away more than taking the people away. Take the power away, and you really don't care who's in office in Washington because they can't harm you anymore. But as long as that power is there, it's going to attract the worst elements of society. Armin, thanks so much for uh, calling in tonight. And we're going to go now to Chuck in Fullerton, California. Good evening, Chuck. Oh, hey. What's up? Well, I wanted you to do a little checking. You know, George Bush said something, I think, in October of 2002 that is so telling of of our government and, and our where Bush sees us in this in this world stage. What he said, and maybe you'll remember because it, to me it was a nurse shattering statement, he said the United States will no longer allow there to be another Soviet Union. In other words, not only is he carving out at an imperialistic position for himself, but he's preventing imperialism from anybody else. Sure. Do you recall that? No, I didn't. I didn't hear that uh, particular phrase. I did hear that he was saying that they were no longer going to support dictators, which of course is absolutely ridiculous. Right now, yeah. they're supporting a dictator in Uzbekistan, they're another one in, one in the United States, in another one in Pakistan, and of course that they're still passively supporting through foreign aid and other means uh, dictators all over the world in Indonesia and various other places. So obviously, uh, the, it's a, a very empty uh, gesture on his part. But I didn't hear the part about the Soviet Union specifically. Well. It's not about the Soviet Union specifically. It's what he's saying is if anybody sure. begins to get powerful enough to threaten the United States' world supremacy, we'll that, knock we will, down. that we will do something about it, knock them down. Yes. And can you think of a more imperialistic statement by a head of state? No, it's not imperialism because it's America that's doing it, and America is always right. Whatever our <laughs> government does is always correct, and so it's not the same thing as Nazi imperialism or British imperialism or Chinese imperialism or Spanish imperialism or Soviet imperialism. This is American imperialism. Of course, it's not really American imperialism because that's an oxymoron. Well, that's uh, one of the things that uh, I, 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 I'd like to condemn the Christian right for, and that is to promulgate this idea that we are the good guys. Mm-hmm. We are not the good guys. We are, I mean, when you say we, talking about the United States, we have been more culpable for disasters around the world and around history than any other nation. In fact, I've been saying for a long time that there is not a single communist nation that wasn't moved into the communist camp without the active help of the United States. And that includes Russia itself. Well, surprise, surprise, this is Harry Brown, and I'm terribly sorry. The connection broke at my end this time, and that was from me moving something on my desk. And I have a very fragile little black box that sits on my desk, and I should know better than to touch anything on my desk during the two hours that I'm on the air. Did we lose Chuck? 
I'm terribly, terribly sorry about that, but Chuck did get his chance to make the point, and that was that the United States is going to strike down anybody that challenges its supremacy in the world. And, of course, uh, the point I wanted to make is that the idea of American imperialism is an oxymoron because America was founded on the concept of freedom from government, and freedom from government means freedom from government meddling around the world or meddling at home. It doesn't matter where it is. America was meant to be the one beacon of liberty in the world, the haven for people who wanted peace and freedom, peace and individual liberty. And by freedom, we're not talking about the Operation Iraqi Freedom or that kind of bogus freedom. We're talking about individual liberty, the liberty that says, I have a right to live my own life and nobody has a right to come in and tell me what I must do with my life. Nobody has a right to come in and take my money and spend it against me by promoting government programs that are bad for me, and nobody has a right to to uh, dominate me in that way. And uh, certainly the idea of either a $2 trillion budget or a government that has troops all over the world is not the concept of peace and liberty that the Founding Fathers had in mind. And that uh, brings me to an email that I received earlier. Dennis says, uh, counting each country that has a few Marines protecting the embassy as having troops in a foreign country is a disingenuous and easy-to-see-through point. But actually, I'm not counting embassy troops. I'm counting countries in which our government has sent troops in to assist the government there. And that number is, I don't know the exact number, but it is over 100 countries around the world in which we have troops that are there other than to guard the American embassy. And, of course, at the same time, we are giving foreign aid to more than 100 countries around the world also. It just goes on and on and on, and it doesn't stop. Well, let's go right now to Harvey in New Orleans. Harvey, are you with us? Yes, sir, an honor, privilege, and a pleasure, sir, and, well, season's greetings, since I don't want to possibly offend you by using the wrong <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, um, let's see. Uh, you, were to- you were talking about, uh, um, and the gentleman, the gentleman, the subtle gentleman before you were speaking about uh, why uh, are we suddenly uh, sandbag Iraq. That's pretty, uh, and mm-hmm. so that I was saying that right, very, in 1990. I absolutely felt that. Uh, the idea of President, uh, former President Bush, number 41, running around and screaming, well, I don't know why he won't get out. I don't know why he won't get out. That was foolish. If he got out, it, it would, uh, his entire uh, political system would have collapsed uh, any more than if Churchill would have. Uh, it was about as realistic as Hitler expecting Churchill to back, not Churchill, um, uh, Chamberlain. Chamberlain to back out of uh, out of his uh, sure. to defend Poland and for uh, for uh, and for uh, Poland and for sure. Chamberlain. Sure, we, we got it, Harvey. Hitler. Hang on, hang on. We got to go to another break. We'll be right back for our final segment. Is Harvey, you're still with us? Yes, sir. Okay, go ahead with what you were saying. Well, it seems to me that uh, in some cases leaders don't seem to understand that if they make they have a working agreement with uh, the with their opposites, uh, they don't seem to understand that uh, if they go into a, a policy that uh, that uh, it's going to cost the other fellow to have uh, to spend an immense amount of political capital and possibly get kicked out uh, of office uh, it's not a very effective uh, policy a general stick you mean you mean putting a pressure on another uh, head of a country of another country to act in a way that would be bad for him politically at home yes sir a uh, general stick said uh, who was the real power behind the uh, Weimar republic said that poland uh, poland is an uh, abomination and uh, it was going to be gotten rid of as soon as possible. <laughs> this was the man who was actually running Germany from behind the scenes. Hmm. And, uh, and what was his name? General Sek? Sek. That's not how it's spelled. <laughs> oh, I... That, according to uh, Ed Butler, is uh, correct pronunciation. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, um, if I remember correctly, and I'm doing him justice. <laughs> sure, but it's not unusual for a politician uh, to think that he can order people around in other countries without regard for what might be best for them, either as individuals or as the country themselves. Uh, that's just the way of politics, and it's the way that you can expect things to happen once one country seems to gain a dominant position. And the United States is not immune to the kind of sickness that comes from dominance that affected the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe, that affected uh, Nazi Germany in Europe, that affected China at one time, that affected the Spanish Empire, that affected the British Empire. Yes, sir. Uh, with the cruelty that they imposed upon Ireland and India and, and various other places around the world. It... it uh, uh, it's not a question of good guys and bad guys. It's a question of power or no power. Yeah. Everything has to be looked at in those terms. Do we want to give people the power to run other people's lives? And if we do, then we are just asking for trouble. Men are fallible. And what was that, Lord Acton? Uh, ultimate uh, power corrupts and ultimate power corrupts. Uh, uh, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And Michael Cloud said the problem is not the abuse of power. It is the power to abuse. Mm-hmm. Give them the power, and it will be abused. Harvey, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you again. And for the last couple of minutes, let me take a couple of emails. Uh, Chris in Ann Arbor says, I want to wish you a happy belated Bill of Rights Day. It was December 15th, and I have to admit that it came and went without me this year. I 
usually written an article on the subject, but I didn't this year. Chris goes on to say, one would think that Woodrow W. Bush would have mentioned that in his weekly radio address, but I guess it wasn't in the cards. No, I don't think that George Bush would want to mention that. He might have to start talking about Jose Padilla and not keeping people without charging them and uh, violating the various elements of the Bill of Rights. An interesting email from Bob says that conservatives have a pretty solid lock on daytime talk radio and on TV with Fox and other news programs. Liberals are starting to realize that they don't have many outlets to counter the onslaught and are starting to develop their own talk show outlets. It seems to me that a few afternoon radio programs and an evening TV program that attracts both conservatives and liberals would do pretty well. Any plans, Harry? Well, I'll tell you, I have been thinking for the last couple of months about the possibility of having a weekly one-hour television program. A friend of mine in California said, you ought to emulate the, evangel pardon me, the evangelicals and what they've done on television. They can raise money that way, and it just seems to me that a weekly television program with a studio audience and a perhaps even a, a news section where you make fun of what the politicians have been doing the past week with some good humor uh, that you could attract a pretty large audience, and you probably could raise the money to keep it on the air. And it's something I want to think about. And if anybody has any ideas, well, then just email me about it. I'd love to have your thoughts on it, of ways that such a project could uh, proceed. It's uh, It may be just a dream, but it's the dream that I've got right now. But my more immediate objective is to get you to tune in again next Saturday night. Thanks so much for being with me this evening. This is Harry Brown. Have a wonderful week, and I hope the holiday goes very well for you. Good night. Good night.